I'm going to read some words in Philippians chapter 4. So Philippians and chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. I just want to read one verse of scripture. Verse 4. Philippians 4. And verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. So often in life we desire joy, we seek to find joy. But today may our rejoicing truly be in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. May we rejoice that He is the great creator. May we rejoice most of all that He is the great redeemer. That the Saviour has come. The Saviour has left. The Saviour has risen and descended. Rejoice in the Lord. Amen. We'll seek the Lord's face briefly. Prayer. Our gracious Father, we thank the Lord for the privilege to gather here in the house of the Lord this morning. And we ask of thee that this season of worship will be owned and blessed of thyself. And we pray, dear Lord, that we will be very conscious from the beginning right until the very end of the Lord's healthy granted come and minister to every waiting soul. And may this truly be a time of rejoicing. We pray in our Lord's great name. Amen. Amen. We're going to turn in the psalm section of the hymn book, the very opening section of the hymn book, to Psalm 23, on page 20. Very well known words, the Lord's my shepherd. And today, our great theme through the meeting will be the shepherds in Luke chapter 2. That's how appropriate it was that the message of Christ's birth would be delivered to shepherds, for our Saviour himself is the great Shepherd. So Psalm 23, the Lord's my shepherd and stuff.
take the Lord's face to gather prayer. Let's pray. Our gracious Father, how we rejoice today in the great truth of these words that we have been singing. The Lord's my shepherd. We thank thee that the Christian has come to enjoy that great truth that Jesus Christ is the good shepherd of his sheep. We thank thee that we have come to see that great truth that he is the chief shepherd. We thank thee that he is the shepherd that has led down his life for the sheep. We thank thee that it is on the basis of the death of the shepherd that we approach thee today, yea, it is on the basis of that great truth that we dare to say that the Lord is my shepherd. What an amazing truth that the perfect Son of God would be called ours. What a privilege to call him man. And O oh Lord, we pray today that the great truths of Christ will rejoice our hearts during this season of worship today. And in all that we see, we pray chiefly that we will see him. O oh Lord, be pleased to undertake in every part of the meeting. We pray that the voice of the Lord will be heard speaking to us. O oh Lord, we pray that this will be a season when the Lord comes near. O oh Lord, we look to thee that all that's said and done will be to our Lord's honour and glory. We thank thee for your blessed hand that's been upon every individual and family over this holiday weekend. And we do pray that as we come to a new year in thy will, that we will know much of the rich blessing of God in 2022. Oh Lord, our eyes are looking up to thee. And we yearn for a new thing. Lord, in this new year as it approaches, we pray that we will have great anticipation of the of a mighty move of God among us. Visit us, we pray. And oh Lord, we pray that we will know the Lord coming near and working in the midst of this God. Oh Lord, we do ask of thee, dear Lord, that you will have mercy upon our nation. Have mercy upon our leaders. We pray, Lord, that they will be given wisdom, not the wisdom of man, we recognize in these days we need something much more than that. We pray that there will be a looking on to the Lord for wisdom. And Lord, that that great wisdom will be granted. Oh Lord, come then, we pray. Bless not only this congregation, but every faithful witness across our land, very especially. We remember our own sister congregations. And we pray that your and will rest upon them, and Lord, that they too will know times of increase and blessing. So we commend our season to thee today, come and gather with us. We thank the Lord for your name. Amen. Amen. On Friday evening past, Paris and Kathleen were ministering a song, and the words they were singing didn't have days with them, so and they were under a bit of added pressure, and so we've asked Harrison, our Harrison Kathleen, to come and just sing for us the this morning. And after they come to sing, her brother Bess is going to come with the message.
were they the first ones to receive this wonderful news? And obviously we can't answer that categorically. We do not know the mind of God on these things, but I think there is a possible thought in this that the shepherds were not found people. They did not think highly of themselves. In fact, if you look right back to Genesis 46, we find that the Egyptians, as Joseph and told his brothers, the Egyptians despised shepherds and those who tended herds and flocks. They were regarded as unskilled, uneducated, and if there were class systems back then, as they always have been, they would have been regarded as the lower class of people. It's very wrong for us to look at someone's job or what they do for a living and look down on them because of it. But that has been something the shepherds have lived with all, all, the, all the generations. And perhaps the Lord sent the gospel to them first to show that the gospel is not class conscious. It is not just for the rich. It is not just for the educated. It is for all men. Peter was called to go and speak in Cornelius' house. The Lord said, God is no respecter of persons. He that feareth them in every nation will be received. But there is a condition for those who will obey the gospel. The condition is this, we must receive it with a humble heart. David, who himself was a shepherd, said the sacrifices of God, the, the sacrifice that he will receive, is a broken and contrite spirit, a humble heart. And the Lord Jesus says, that is why it is so hard for the rich to be saved. Now young people, how do you define who is rich and who is poor? I will try to help you in a few moments, in a few minutes. Firstly, there is a definition of what they call the extreme poverty around the world. What they classify as extreme poverty is people who have to live on less than one US dollar per day. For us, it's less than a dollar fifty per day. So they, if they earn three hundred and sixty-five dollars in a year, that's all they have to live on. We know most of us can spend that in a week on groceries. That is called extreme poverty. And approximately one billion people in the world, of six billion people, live in extreme poverty. Take it a step further, almost half of the world, about 3 billion people, or 46% of the world, live in poverty. Not extreme poverty, but they live on less than $5.50 a day. Less than 5 dollars That is about $2,000 in a year. If we compare them with ourselves now, the average, the, the minimum wage in Australia is $20, not a day hour. And then you start to see, perhaps we are living in a rich country. Perhaps we are rich. And then we think of the shepherds who received this gospel. They received it because they had humble and poor hearts. And young people, we need to be careful living in a country like Australia that we do not become proud and arrogant as the nation around us, as a rich nation. Our Lord said, a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. I say to young people, beware the arrogance of the nation of Australia. Be careful of people around you who say there is no sin. And if there's no sin, there's no real need for a savior. In fact, we're not even sure if God exists. Well, the gospel came to the shepherds because they didn't think like that. They thought lowly of themselves. They didn't think they were great. But they thought highly of the gospel that was presented to them. It says when the first angel spoke to them in a bright light, it says they were sore afraid. They didn't laugh at it. They didn't dismiss it as something strange. They were afraid. They were hearing words from heaven itself. I encourage you, young people, when you read God's word, think of it that you are hearing words from heaven itself. You receive them with fear. But they also receive them with joy. 
After the first angel spoke, it says there was a host of angels singing and worshipping God. And they said to, to the shepherds, in verse 9, verse 10 says, Sorry, fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. This is the gospel to all people. In other words, implied in that to the shepherds, it includes you. This is the good news of great joy for you too. And if they were still wondering if that included them, verse 11, the angel says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Unto you, shepherds, who think lowly of yourselves, unto you is born this day a Savior. They thought lowly of themselves, but they thought highly of the message from heaven. And we know that they thought highly of it because as soon as they heard it, they acted on it, they obeyed it. The young people, every one of us reacts to the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is no neutral place to stand. You either receive it or you reject it. The shepherds, as soon as they heard this, the good news, they said, we must go. We must go and see what has been told us. And prompt obedience shows that they thought highly of the gospel. Although they were shepherds, they were also sheep, like us. They too were sinners. All like all we like sheep have gone astray. But we return to the shepherd of our souls. Here's the wonder. That although shepherds may be looked down on as uneducated, unskilled, low-income earners, our Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, is not ashamed to be called the shepherd. And people come to him. He is the good shepherd. He gives his life for his sheep. Our loving and gracious heavenly Father, we thank you this day for the gospel of thy dear Son. Lord, we thank you that it is good news to all people. Lord, I pray for each young soul here today that, oh Lord, they would hear the good news and respond with like the shepherds do with instant obedience and give worship and honor and glory to the only begotten Son of God. We thank you for him who was willing to take on humanity, though he is the eternal Son of God, and he was willing to take on a flesh and blood in order that he might die, in order that he might be the good shepherd who gives his life for the sheep. Oh Lord, take each young soul, each young heart here today Lord, and make them a sheep of thy pasture. Lead them in green pastures, besides still in quiet pastures. Keep them close to the shepherd's son. We ask in Jesus' name. We'll continue our worship by turning to him 82.
probably know well and have heard often, but give attention to the reading of God's word and think of the shepherds as they receive the good news of the gospel. Thank you, Babis, for bringing the message to the boys and girls and also for leading in that offering him. Return, please, in God's word to Luke chapter 2, the Gospel of Luke, and the chapter 2. There's no Sunday school today, no Sunday school during the school holidays. It will recommence when the term begins again. Making the assumption that most people want to go away soon after the meeting today, so we haven't officially organized refreshments, but uh, the, the, the hot water is there. If anyone wants something hot to drink, or there are plenty of cold drinks in the fridge as well. So if the children want uh, some cold drinks, they are there in the fridge. There's some cookies, so do wait behind if you'd like to wait behind for a time of fellowship after the meeting. Next Lord's Day morning will be the Lord's table. So next Lord's Day morning, the first Lord's Day of the new month will be the Lord's table. And then also, uh, tomorrow being the public holiday, there will be no men's prayer meeting. So no men's prayer meeting tomorrow, but the Wednesday evening prayer meeting will be as usual at 7. We're going to uh, turn, as we already indicated, to Luke's Gospel, chapter 2. Luke, chapter 2. We'll read from the verse 1. The verse 1. It came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed or enrolled. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished, that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And they were in the same country, shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore, very afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you Good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. It came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go, even on to Bethlehem, and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with peace found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the same, or made known over a wide geographical area, made known abroad the same, which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. And then there, knowing the Lord will bless the reading of this precious truth. We'll seek the Lord's face briefly in prayer. 
for the Lord's help as we come to the ministry of the Word. Let us each pray that the Lord will come and minister to our hearts. Our gracious Father, we thank the Lord for your precious truth and the thoughts that we have already had today as we have pondered upon the shepherds. We pray that again the help of God will be given. As we look at this passage, we pray, like Mary, that we would keep all these things and ponder them in our hearts. To that end, we pray for the mighty help of the Spirit of God. Come, we pray, open up the Scriptures to us, teach us from thy truth. In 1949, A.W. Pink wrote a work on the subject of Revelation, not the book of Revelation, but God being the one that reveals himself to the world. In the introduction to that book, he spoke about the prevailing materialism and the prevailing skepticism that existed at that time across the face of the earth, most especially in the Western world. He spoke about great centers of learning and their corrupting influences. He spoke about the media attacking the very foundations of the righteous. Those matters perhaps are more relevant for our time than they were even back 70 years ago. He mentioned then two great truths. The scripture as an authoritative and inerrant revelation. The scripture as an authoritative and the scripture as an inerrant or without error revelation. Pink said it is not only the most horrible impiety but the height of irrationality to doubt the one or to call into question the other. It's the height of irrationality to doubt the authority and the inerrancy of the word God. You see, when we consider the reality of God revealed in creation and every evidence around us of God's great being. When we consider even our own constitution, our own physical makeup, it's irrational for us to question the existence of God. As the scripture rightly says, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. If it's irrational then to say there is no God, it follows that it would be irrational to say that such a God of power and wisdom could not reveal himself. So if we accept that it's irrational to deny the existence of God, that the theory of evolution and Big Bang and so on is irrational, and that is the case, then it would also be irrational to suggest that God cannot reveal himself. In theology, we normally divide God's revelation into two broad categories. We talk about natural revelation. That is, God revealing himself in creation. As we look around us, and we live in a beautiful place, we see much evidence of the great creator. And then there is what we call supernatural revelation supernatural revelation. See, natural revelation tells us there is a God. But natural revelation doesn't tell us how we can come to know that God. We need then God to reveal himself in some way other than creation itself. And all through the Old Testament, God was revealing himself through prophets. God was revealing himself through dreams, through visions. 
our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, came as the great revelation of God. Through the apostolic era, the Lord was still revealing himself through miraculous sign gifts, leading to the completion of the great canon of Scripture, the Word of God. And what has any of this to do with the shepherds? Well, that night as the shepherds were in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night, they had before them natural revelation. The heavens declare the glory of God. And that night, before the angel appeared, those men were left without excuse, as every sinner in the world is. They saw the heavens, they saw the skies, they saw the stars. They were left without excuse. The heavens declare the glory of God. And yet, as have said, that was not enough to bring them to know God. So they knew certain things about God by looking up at the night sky, but they needed this supernatural revelation. And that's what this whole section then is about. If you look with me at verse 15, it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven. The shepherds said one to another, Let us go even on to Bethlehem, and see this thing which has come to pass, and these words I want to draw your attention to, which the Lord hath made known unto us. This night the angel has been the messenger of God. The word angel means messenger. The angel and the angelic host have been the messengers, making known, revealing something to us. Verse 17. When they had seen it, they made known abroad the same which was told them. They declared what had been revealed to them. Then verse 20, the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. And again, the whole emphasis there is on God's revelation. You and I do not need a visitation from angels to know God's will, God's word, God's truth. You and I don't need to meet someone that claims to have had such an encounter. In fact, if we did, need to put them through some rigorous testing as the word of God would indicate to us. We don't need an angel to come because we have the written word of God. God's truth is revealed in Holy Scripture as Peter said we have a more sure word of prophecy, more reliable than if an angel did come. So what I want to do this morning with the Lord's help is to seek to open up this section that is before us and look at these things of redemption, sorry, these things of revelation. And so I want us to take this thing where there was a special revelation, but apply it as to the scripture being God's revelation to you and I. I want to see first of all that God's special revelation is focused on the evangel. God's special revelation is focused on the evangel. Uh, and this was true then concerning what the angels brought to the shepherds as well as what God brings to you and I through the book, through the word of God. It's focused on the evangel. So if you look with me in verse 10, the angel, and in this case we're not told who the angel was, perhaps was Gabriel that we've already encountered in chapter 1, but it certainly was an angel. But the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings, good tidings of great joy. The words here, good tidings, they're translating a Greek word from which we get our word evangel, evangelistic, evangelical. 
those words all come from this particular Greek word. So if we read it in that way, I bring you the evangel, because the evangel is good news, the gospel, the good news. And here was the good news, a baby has been born unto you, is born this day, and notice it says, in the city of David. The angel didn't say, unto you is born in Bethlehem. Why was that? Surely the angel was taking them right back to the Old Testament scriptures. Christ was born in Bethlehem because he was the line of David. He was of the line of David. He is the anointed one, the Messiah, David's greater son. And so it was no accident that the angel referred to Bethlehem in this very specific way. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And the angel was explaining the birth of this baby is unique. As we saw on Friday night past, the words here indicate his true humanity. He was a baby wrapped in cloth. So his humanity was real. Mary didn't look at this baby and say, well, he's something different, so he doesn't need to be cared for as babies are cared for. His humanity was true. But then he is Christ, the Lord, the Lord. He is God manifest in flesh. I want you to come down with me to verse 14 where this one angel is joined by the great angelic host and they sing or say these great words in verse 14. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, good will toward men. Now those words, especially the words at the end of verse 14 are often quoted and printed at this time of year. On earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Even the liberals very often will take those words and they will say this is the meaning of Christmas. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. And they want to present the message of Jesus being the message of world peace. They want to present the message of Jesus as being a message of social justice, that Jesus brings good relationships, Jesus brings equality, but more often than not, they have divorced those thoughts from the first part of the text, which explain how we are to actually understand these words, peace on earth goodwill to men. Notice the verse begins, glory to God in the highest. And the words then in verse 14, the latter part of the verse, do not mean as the liberals will say, love is love, so all is accepted. Goodwill toward men. For that notion contradicts the beginning of the verse, which says, Glory to God. And so the goodwill toward men cannot contradict that which is glorifying to God. So the purpose in Christ's coming was first and foremost to glorify God. Flowing from that, there would be peace on earth, goodwill toward men. It's vital that we always remember that order. It's a vital part of the gospel, which sadly is often forgotten in today's so-called evangelicalism, where the gospel is presented as something very man-centered. It's glory to God in the highest. Christ then came to live a perfect life. To the 
authority of God. Before his death in John 17, our Lord prayed in verse 4, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. I have glorified thee on the earth. Through our Lord's life and ministry, he had glorified Father. In his death, he glorified the Father. His death was a sinless sacrifice. The demands of justice were met. And so on the cross, Christ was not appealing that God's demands would be set aside. He died to meet those demands. God's justice was honored. Our Lord's resurrection and ascension to glory were the glorified of God. It's on this basis then that there is the great message of peace. The message of peace then on earth is peace on earth as man firstly comes to know peace with God. And as man knows peace with God, he is able to live in peace with his fellow man to the glory of God. The word that's translated in the authorized version, goodwill, or the words goodwill, word man and the word there in Greek is the idea of good pleasure delight pleasure toward man delight toward man that is God would come to find pleasure in man how does the Lord find pleasure in man not by excusing them in their persistence in sin. God has his good will. God takes pleasure as he sees the work of his son applied to him. As he sees the people redeemed through the glorious work of his son. I come back to my point then. God's special revelation is focused on the evangelist this good news. The gospel is a God-centered message. And this book, from cover to cover, the word of God is full of the truth of the evangel. Luke chapter 2, 14, in many ways then, is really just a summary of the entire Bible. What is the message of the entire Bible? Glory to God in the highest. Honor, peace, goodwill toward man. What the verse then is showing that such a message needed to be communicated because the earth is naturally at enmity with God. How is it today? between the natural man and the holy God. The case is that man is in rebellion against God, on earth enmity. On earth, man doing that which is displeasing to God. It's only the gospel that can bring a transformation where God and his sinners God's special revelation is focused on the evangel. I want to say then, secondly, that God's special revelation is to be obeyed. If you look with me in verse 12, this shall be a sign unto you, ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in the manger. Ye shall find. When the angel brought that message, the angel was not suggesting this is a take it or leave it type circumstance. If you were interested, if you want to pursue the matter further, that's where you can find. The implication is you must go and find. So though it's not so much stated as a command, it's implied. Ye shall find 
Go and find the baby, wrapped in the swaddling clothes. Notice then verse 15. It came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven. The shepherds said one to another, let us now go on to heaven and see this thing. Let's go and find it. And therefore we can say that that verse really is a verse of obedience. They didn't view this revelation as something that was merely theoretical. It wasn't just something to tickle their ears. It was a message that needed to be responded to. And God's revelation then, God's special revelation, is not merely a matter for intellects to discuss. But it's a message for sinners to respond to. And for the Christian... The Bible is not just a message that we are to think upon and meditate upon. We are to. But it is a message that we are to obey. And so thinking about the evangel, that good news of the gospel, it is not merely given as advice. The gospel is not to the sinner may want to consider going to Jesus for mercy. No, the gospel is a command. Repent. Believe. And thereby, Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 8, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel. So those that are condemned forever, they will be condemned because they are disobedient. God's special revelation, it has this command, a command that is to be obeyed. And the beautiful thing we have in this particular portion is that as these men were told, ye shall find Christ, they were being taught that Christ was accessible we shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes led in the manger we've already heard today how the shepherds came from the lower social strata but they could come to the manger they may never have gained access to a palace but they come to a manger, ye shall find. And today, dear sinner in the meeting, this is the good news. Jesus Christ is accessible. Ye shall find. If you seek him, if you search for him with all your heart, you shall find him. And he am Bounds wrote a lot of work on the subject of prayer. But he wrote this concerning God's revelation. God's revelation does not need the light of human genius. The polish of culture, sorry, the polish and strength of human culture, the brilliance of human thought, the force of human brains to adore it or enforce it. But it demands the simplicity, humility, and faith of a child's heart. God's revelation demands the humility that brokenness to come say here am I an unworthy sinner but there is access for one that is lowly to one that humbles himself who is exalted therefore today Dear unconverted one, God's word demands a response from you. Repent and believe. We who have repented and believed, God's word demands a response from us. Be ye holy, for I am holy. As the Lord taught that lesson from the parable of the Good Samaritan, go and do thy likewise. We are to be a people who obey.
want to see then thirdly that God's special revelation is to be broadcast. God's special revelation is to be broadcast. Verse 17, when they had seen it, they made known abroad, around that area, the saying which was told them concerning the child. They published what was revealed to them. And these shepherds then were missionaries. These shepherds were evangelists. They had received a message. They communicated it. The message they brought was a very simple message. They made known the same which was told them. And one of the such depths in the message that the angel brought to the shepherds. It's simple, isn't it? It's easy to understand. It was a message that these shepherds understood. Yes, there were depths in it that they might not have appreciated. But they understood the simplicity of the message that they were out and they told very often the reason why God's people are silent today is that we recognize that we don't know everything. That there are questions that we just don't know the answer for. There are subjects that we're not on top of. We don't know all of the arguments about creation. Maybe you don't know all, and we don't know all the details about Christ's return. Perhaps you feel, I don't understand all of those chapters in the book of Leviticus about the sacrifices. I'm just a very ordinary person. That's what you're thinking today. Surely that's what the shepherds would have said about themselves. We're just very ordinary. Yet those were the men that the Lord took to spread the news. Isn't it interesting then that the angel did go to Herod, that he might broadcast it? The angel did go to the high priest. The angel did go to the mayor of Bethlehem. He came to these very ordinary men. And that pattern of how the Lord works is still true today. Remember in the latter part of 1 Corinthians 1, it talks about how the Lord calls the foolish things in this world. So there are not many of the noble that are called. There are some. The Lord very often saves very ordinary people. That's one reason why we should never despise the outcasts. We should seek to go to them. Because it's such that very often the Lord is pleased to work in their hearts and lives to see. What I want to emphasize is this. These men went out as very ordinary men carrying a very simple message. That's what the Lord asked of you that we know that men and women are sinners. We know that there's a great Savior for sinners. We know that the demand is repentant belief. Let us go and take that message and broadcast it. It was a message that brought a response. Because in verse 18, all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. They marveled. They held this in admiration. Surely this was a case of the words of early ordinary men confounding the wise. And isn't this what we need today? The Lord taking the ordinary and using it to confound the mighty. The wise in their own eyes. May the Lord give us such a passion for those around us. May the Lord help us to see the lost. 
as we had never viewed them before. Out of a heart of love to go forth praying over the message that it would be true that there would be those that wonder at the words. We also see the response of Mary in verse 19. Mary kept all these things. That word very literally means Mary. That the word kept very literally means that Mary kept guard. With guard all these things. She wanted to make sure they were kept in there. The word ponder it very literally means with throwing. That is, she was throwing these truths around her mind. This is to be our reaction. We are to pray that such would be the reaction in the hearts of the hearers of the gospel. I want to say finally that God's special revelation brings joy. Verse 20. The shepherds return glorifying and praising God for all the things that they have heard and seen as it was told unto them. The message of the coming of Christ is a message of great joy. Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. And as they were told, here is a message of joy. We see that it did change these men. They were transformed into men of joy, glorifying and praising God. Now it may be that that night, as they were watching their sheep during the night watches, now if they looked at this as something of a routine night, yes, I'm sure they talked about how busy Bethlehem was. I'm sure they talked over some of the significance of this census that was taking place. But otherwise, it was a night of sameness, wasn't it? But yet the message that the angel brought delivered them from that sameness. Here was something that brought joy. This revelation is like medicine. Today, surely the great need for joy all around us we see great fear we don't very often see much joy the word of God at first often comes causing fear bringing conviction we pray that we do that work when the sinner is convicted and he's brought to see the good message of the gospel God's word is like medicine. What joy it brings. What delight it brings. The world offers joy. But it can never deliver those goods. Voltaire, the great infidel, found that his unbelief didn't bring joy. Recorded that Voltaire said in the latter part of his life, I wish I had never been born. There wasn't much joy in unbelief, was there? Lord Byron, a man who had great wealth, a man who enjoyed great pleasure, he said, The worm, the canker, and grief are mine alone. Worldly pleasures and entertainment have brought joy to him. A great American millionaire when dying is said to have said, I suppose I am the most miserable man on earth. Money have not brought him joy. Said that Alexander the Great, after his great conquest, said, in lamentation, there are no more worlds to conquer. His great victories, the reaching of ambition, did not 
bring joy. Today, if you lack joy, heed this message. I bring you good tidings of great joy. Great joy. Shepherds fight. Lord fight. Praise God. I wonder, are these shepherds Provided lambs for the temple. Bethlehem isn't too far away from Jerusalem. It may have been that from among these flocks that the very best would be brought to Jerusalem as sacrificial lambs. Isn't it a wonderful thought? At that night in Bethlehem was born perfect lamb. The perfect lamb that would be brought to Jerusalem as the sacrifice. That perfect lamb through his work would be the one that would bring joy. May you look to him today. As we think of that subject of God's special revelation, here is God's revelation unto us. He's born in the city of a city. Which is Christ the Lord. May the Lord take his word right in front of us. We'll go out together please in prayer. Perhaps the Lord has spoken to your heart today. Perhaps it's true in your life that there's a lack of joy. Surely if there's a lack of joy Life must be traced to a lack of joy in Jesus Christ. Perhaps even your prayer today ought to be this show me Christ in British. Show me the beauty of His work. Keep my attention fixed on the Lord. Reveal Himself through His word to our hearts. Our gracious Father, we ask that you'll take your truth and write it upon our hearts. We pray that through this day, our great delight will be the message of the Lamb, who is the shepherd. We pray for any in our gathering who are yet unconverted, that this will be the day. Continue with us. Last brother begs, please to come and leave us in our
gracious Father, we pray that that joy would indeed be ours this day. And bless our fellowship together. And take us each to our homes in safety. Bless the gathering of thy people this afternoon. We pray again that we will know the help and the fellowship that there is with our Lord. We want to him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, now and ever. 